Long ago, in the ancient land of Wisconsin, a group of nerds delved deep into the depths of Milwaukee Area Technical College. It was neither gold nor silver they sought, but knowledge of video games and the video game industry. They called this epic journey, The Dev Quest. Welcome to the Dev Quest, a podcast where we talk about video games and the video game industry. I'm your host, John Harwood, and neither of my hosts or my co-hosts are here today. So instead, we have Casey Kasem with the Top Forty. Yes, the deceased Casey Kasem, uh, and also No Rotter and Ian Ehlers. And we'll be and today we will be discussing uh, what do you guys think of uh, Activision's uh, acquisition of King the Candy Crush developer. Ian, you first. Cuz from you. as far as like for a market standpoint it's a brilliant idea. Is it? Yeah. Because it's that Candy Crush makes I think or a couple million dollars like in a week okay. because of all the like microtransactions. I mean, they're going to make that money back pretty quickly. I mean, yeah. I have no doubt that they thought about that for a long time, but it's that it was a good idea. And if it turns out to be a bad one, then I'd be amazed. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I read an article somewhere that said uh, Activision wanted to acquire King because uh, Activision already has a big, uh, a very big claim on the PC and console markets, and so it also want like a huge claim on the mobile market as well. So mm-hmm. they're kind of thinking that now they're this big, like you know, powerful entity in every uh, aspect of video games in general. Yeah. What do you think about it, Noah? Um definitely a smart move and it's i think it's starting to become more and more common nowadays where these huge uh these huge companies huge publishers buy all these all these even like indie companies smaller companies like people who are like really popular and people who can really you know just make a whole lot of money with their their just their one ip that they have and so i think it's just a smart move Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I probably agree that it's a smart move for Activision because, again, you are, like, sort of cornering all markets there. But the thing is is that I, I'm not too experienced with these, like, big mega deal company exchanges and stuff like that. But uh, I remember, the I think, like, a year ago or so, the big, like, acquisition of the time was uh, Microsoft's acquisition of uh, Mojang, the Minecraft developer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know for the uh, King... Uh, for buying King, Activision shelled out like 5.9 billion dollars, whereas with uh, the Microsoft buying Minecraft, that was like I want to say like close to three billion dollars. And so, do you guys do you guys think that maybe Activision kind of got ripped off with this, or like because it seems like Minecraft just has more probably a bigger user base just because it's on more platforms, whereas with Candy Crush, it's kind of just the Facebook app and then the mobile app as well. Well, I mean, one of the things is that. By purchasing Candy Crush, they also purchased all of its, like, sibling products by King as well. Right. Which, there are so many of them, it's not even funny. So, and I mean, all of them are making money on a daily basis. Right, right. Yeah. Um, formulated my thoughts here. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, we cut yeah. out all the silence, so. Oh, well, that's convenient for me. Who, who was it that um, recently bought Twitch? Twitch. Oh, that was Facebook. Or oh, wait, was it Facebook? Who bought Twitch? It was either Yahoo or Facebook. I want to say it was Yahoo. Actually, I, remember, I think wasn't it? It was Facebook that bought uh, the Oculus, the Oculus company. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, so it seems nowadays all these companies are just purchasing these huge, huge products. These huge um, companies. Yeah, companies. And um, do you know how much? Twitch was bought for. I do not remember how much Twitch. Was. I think it was. I think it was surprisingly small uh, because I was. I also compared that one to the Minecraft purchase as well. Yeah. I think that one was close to like one and a half billion. Yeah. I was gonna even say like lower, like some somewhere in the millions. Yeah, you know what? That that might have been true too. Okay, on to the next topic then. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, YouTube Red, the uh, subscription-based YouTube service where YouTube will remove the ads uh, from your videos? Uh, but you pay a monthly subscription. I think it's like ten dollars or something like that. Um, people are definitely not going to like it, but I think it, eventually it will build up a strong enough user base where it will become a thing. Because people are already willing to play, pay for stuff like Hulu and like Netflix and stuff, and even they still run ads. Uh-huh. 
So if people are still willing to pay for those things, then I think they'll be willing to pay for YouTube Red. Because no one's making any money anymore from ad, from ads on YouTube with like ad block and stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you do you have ad block? I do actually. Yeah. If it's if it's such a controversial question. No, I know, it's but. it's all of our dirty little convenience. Well, so the, the thing is, what I do with ad block is that I have ad block, right? Yeah. And then if there's a particular product or website, then I'm a page that I like to be a patron of, and I will whitelist them on adblock so that I do actually see the ads. I do that with YouTube, so pretty much a lot of the content that I do watch does actually have ads in front of it. Uh, but, like, you know, it's it's just nice to have the ad block stuff when you're going on sites that don't have, like, as good, like, ad yeah. stuff or ad software, I guess, involved with them at the front of the ad or at the front of the content. So, yeah. So I, I use adblock, uh, I would say, sparingly, yeah. There, I think a lot of content creators, content creators out there, have started to realize that ads just don't work anymore. So they've signed up for a Patreon, uh -huh. where you can, where it's their users, their fans can just you know go and pay whatever they want. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that might be catching on, where people pay whatever they want yeah. for the content they get. Yeah, I've definitely seen a big rise in uh, Patreon. Uh, users just sort of like in general yeah I would agree um, I personally think it's a good idea especially for YouTube mm -hmm. because there are always those people that don't really want to deal with ads and I actually don't use ad blocker because I just I, I don't really see the point to it because a lot of the sites that I go to it's like well it is help it's helping them sponsor themselves basically right, right. so I don't really I don't really care about it do you know who is the top earning youtuber currently pewdiepie currently it's pewdiepie yeah um do you know how much he makes uh it's like it's like a ridiculous amount right it's like millions or at least that's what I, that's what i've heard i want to estimate at like i think like eight million a year like just off of his youtube ads okay so um for the bigger channels like pewdiepie like maybe even markiplier stuff like those mm -hmm. shout out to those guys um i don't think ad block really hurts them that much but for a lot of the smaller guys who only got like less than 10,000 subscribers even less than a thousand it probably really hurt them so YouTube Red might actually be helpful to the, for them yeah I think YouTube Red it's definitely I'd say that I don't know if I would use this service uh, for the time being I think they're YouTube's definitely trying to get more than um, trying to add more benefits to the service than just having uh, no ads, right? I know they have this thing where it's like you can download any uh, any YouTube video you want and then just watch it anywhere. Uh, and then I know they've, they've got other things too like that. But I don't really see myself switching over right away unless they add like something. Like, yeah, really unless they cool. have like something worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really have nothing to add about it. I mean, I think it's a good idea. I think it could be useful to the people that don't want to deal with ads. Right. And it's that it's going to help out YouTube and the people that, <clears throat> and the YouTubers, but it's pretty much not going to affect the people who don't use it. Okay. Is this an upcoming thing? YouTube, I think it's, it's you can pay for the service now, I believe. Yeah. How much is the service? I believe it's, uh, I'm not sure. I want to say it's between uh, 14 99 and 9 99 That's not too bad. Yeah. Is it for like a monthly thing? Yeah, it's a monthly subscription. Yeah, subscription. Hmm. All right. Nothing more to add. So on the next one, uh, video game genres. Why are video game genres so confusing to talk about? I know on the podcast we've talked about it before, how like what is an RPG, right? Like I gave the argument that uh, I gave the argument that an RPG was a game where you'd like go around progressing and increasing your stats and stuff like that. But then, Ian, you pointed out that the whole origin of of it being called a role uh, RPG was a role playing game, and so it was just kind of like, well, wait a minute, so. There are games that are called RPGs that don't have you actually role-playing stuff, so it's just kind of confusing like that. So what do you guys, uh, why, why, how did they get this way, right? Because, I don't know, that's just kind of my question. I think, um, I think specifically for RPGs, I think Dungeons & Dragons had a lot to do with how that became a thing. Mm -hmm. Because Dungeons & Dragons really was one of the first if not the first, to have those level progression systems right. in place. So I think people just naturally started to associate the word RPG with like like um, 
with like kind of fantasy stuff like D and D, right? Because you don't see too many um, sci-fi RPGs out there. Today. Well, th- th- there are though. They do exist. They like, do exist, uh, but they're. I mean, compared to like the fantasy ones, I suppose so. Yeah, it's still. Well, I mean, we we were talking about Fallout Four earlier, and that's an RPG, you would say, right? Because yeah. it will it has a lot of those stats, and it also has like a role playing aspect to you, where you create a character and then you play that character. So in a way, that's closer to like what D and D was. And I think I agree with you that D and D was sort of the main uh, sort of contributor for the uh, genre of being called that. Yeah, um, um, I would say, I don't know. I guess my question is though, how did we? So there are also there's also a genre called a JRPG, right? Yeah. And the JRPG is their whole thing is well, first of all, it's kind of messed up because it's just based entirely on the fact that it's Japanese in origin, yeah. right? So like already, I think it's kind of confusing. But I always found JRPGs to be more about progressing and uh, increasing your stats and stuff than like American RPGs would be. Like I've, I've never played a JRPG. And then been like, oh, I'm playing this character. It's always been like, I either want to go and hear about the story, or I want to like progress my stats and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I always thought the difference between a Western RPG and a JRPG was, for the longest time, was um, sort of stylistically between um, the anime influences and JRPGs with like Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, that one, oh, Chrono Trigger, you know, all influenced by by the anime because it's so popular. Right. Uh, and then, like Western RPGs, would is, is, are all more influenced by things like classical fantasy, like Tolkien-esque fantasy, and um, sort of a- '80s kind of sci-fi. Right. But that's no longer the case because we have stuff like Dark Souls now, which is could be classified as a JRPG since it came from Japan. Right. But it it looks more western than that's true it yeah. does yeah and th- that game is like primarily about like stats and stuff but there are I, I do know that there are people that do like role play their own characters and stuff in that whole world yeah. so yeah so, Ian you have an opinion on this well as far as like genres in general the reason they actually got started is because it would it tended to be like oh well it matches like they or how do I put it with a lot of games they started genres it was that like oh, well, this is... There's no other thing that's like it, so it's just this. Yeah. I mean, first-person shooters were started by um, Doom. Right. Because it's that no one really knew what a shooter was. So they were like, oh, well, why don't we just call it a first-person shooter? Because that's what you're doing. Well, they had, like, they had uh, like bullet hell and stuff like that. And then weren't those called, like, shooters? And all the, like, space games where you go around, like, blasting alien ships and stuff. Yeah, but it's that those were more... That was before, like, they were really, like, genres. Right. Yeah. Because it's that they were just, they were a video game. Yeah. We really didn't have genres until, like, maybe the 90s. Well, I feel like, I feel like there were, I know... uh, Probably maybe, like, the 80s. I feel like in the 80s, yeah. Because I know Nintendo labeled all of their stuff, like, adventure or, like, action and stuff like that. Yeah. And so, I don't know, I guess... Part, I feel like it's just all video game genres now are just kind of like this weird conglomeration of like uh, of like community based observations and then also like businessmen from like the 80s who just have like these like uh, these like genre remnants still left like in the culture and there's just kind of like all sorts of like crap being thrown into the like genre bin that we all just kind of select from yeah I find it very interesting that that books and movies kind of follow the same genres right in in more in theme like that you have like westerns fantasies horror yeah but games like don't usually get get like uh classified like that right like it's based video games tend to get based more on just like the mechanics yeah rather than the overall like theme yeah, like, and tone of it like platform is like what What's a platformer? Right, like, and, and that's another thing, too, is that when you say platformer, I imagine, like, a 2D side-scroller, yeah. but I imagine somebody else would imagine, like, oh, that's, like, you know, Tomb Raider and Laura Croft and or jumping like, like, around. Like Banjo. Yeah, yeah, or, like, Banjo-Kazooie, or, uh, what was I going to say? Well, that's a good example, so I'll go with that one, but... Yeah. And I find it weird that, like, for as many times as the video game industry has tried to emulate Hollywood, that we, we almost... 
picked up none of their none of their uh, tropes. Right, yeah, right. So, like there, I don't think there are any romantic comedy video games. Yeah, that's a that's unless, a good thing. Unless you count, <laughs> unless you count like um, like those high school games where you know uh, where it's like the choose your own adventure. I forget what they're called. Uh, dating simulator. Games? Yeah, dating sims. Right. If that's the closest thing we have to a rom com. Yeah, I guess that's that's probably what I would equate a rom com to. Yeah. So maybe. It's I feel like dating dating simulator is almost sort of it, that's an example of a genre that like is very specific and I think fits well as a genre because you're not gonna like yeah you're not gonna like confuse a dating simulator with like any other kind of game right yeah well uh, what's the, what would you say the difference is between a genre or a genre genre whatever you, how you ever pronounce it and like a niche a niche yeah. Uh, so you just mean like a niche genre, or? Well, yeah, um, because when I think of genre, I think of like action, or like adventure. Okay. And when I think of like a niche, I think of something that combines like f- like three different genres at once. In, okay. In like a really crazy way. So I I always thought of genres. If we're talking about movies, uh, I would always I would consider a genre to be horror or like drama. And then, if you want to be more descriptive about what, uh, about like what the movie is about, you could say that it's a, uh, you could say that it's a like zombie movie horror or something like that, yeah. or you could say it's like a slasher horror movie, or you just say a slasher because there's not really like slasher romantic comedy movies, right? Yeah. Uh, and then same thing with like comedy, you could say it's a romantic comedy, or you can just kind of say that it's like a dark kind of comedy. Uh, or they're also like comedic horror movies too. So you can also kind of like mix and match all the movie genres too. But with video games, you mix and match all the genres. But by the time you get done doing that, you ha- you wind up with like an MMO first person RPG yeah. adventure game. And it's like why? <laughs> That's just such a long name to say. Either the best game or the worst game, right? Ever. Yeah. And I, I also have a problem with the, with the word adventure too in uh, yeah. in genres because people just add that word on the end of their genre to make it sound more like interesting. Yeah. But it really doesn't doesn't say anything. You know what genre the 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 name I have a problem with is actually like fantasy. Yeah, I because because people always think of fantasy as like this real token esque kind of elves and dwarves. Right. When really the raw definition of fantasy is anything you can imagine right right so something like earthbound would be a fantasy right because it's so you know weird and out there uh like even sci-fi can be classified as fantasy yeah i don't i don't think i've ever told anyone this but i always considered star wars to be fantasy in space rather than like sci-fi yeah exactly also by the way george is here everyone yeah george just don't say anything just leave the audience hanging yeah that's how you know we should give our we should get our live studio audience to clap. Yeah, yeah. Yay! I'll put I'll put in uh, I'll put in like a generic sound effect of like an audience clapping. <laughs> uh, so hey George, how's it going? We're discussing uh, video game genres and why they're so confusing. We discussed how uh, uh, what were we were discussing. We we're discussing how like advent the word adventure is just kind of tacked on the end of like lots of video game genres adventure. and stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Um, I was saying something about fantasy, and then you were saying something. Uh, I said something about Star Wars and how... Oh, yeah, that's, it's basically a fantasy in space. Yeah. Because it, it, Star Wars does have all the, the tropes of a fantasy thing. Uh-huh. With, like, the knight and the wizard and stuff like that. So, calling it um, a sci-fi fantasy is fitting. Right. So, what... Uh, what is sci-fi fantasy too? Because I see that on Netflix all the time. Like, so is, are, is it? Are they just? Is Netflix just grouping sci-fi and fantasy together into like the same list, or is there yeah, like? The nerd list. Is there like? Is it like two <laughs> separate things? I guess is what I'm asking. Um. I think nowadays people will always mix and match genres to try and get something new out of it. Okay. And what might be one person's definition of sci-fi fantasy might not be another person's. So one person might think Star Wars for sci-fi fantasy. Another person might think something like, like kind of like something steampunky. Right. Where it's science fiction, but it's also fantastical. Okay. 
my well, my, my or did you want to say something, Joe? You don't you don't think that's that's kind of weird though? Because the definition for science fiction is or sci-fi is science fiction, which is anything that's you know we thought of that's not actually you know true in science, which is pretty much everything that is it like from steampunk to Star Wars, and then like the whole fantasy thing, you know that like it's it's not necessarily um, you know different than sci-fi because they're both mean they both mean something fake so right yeah well i always took sci-fi to be it's uh something that's based on science but not really not necessarily proven whereas with fantasy i always considered fantasy to be to be something that has nothing to do with science it just has it's just you you've established a world where there are different rules to the ones we have whereas with sci-fi it's sort of establishing uh the rules for re- uh, for this reality are basically the same as your reality. Okay, so when you put it like that way, then I understand what he means, and it makes more sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, how I used to differentiate sci-fi and fantasy was that I always thought sci-fi was sort of like future fantasy, while fantasy, in the classical sense, is more like past fantasy. Right. You know, like old legends and stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh... Ian, have anything? I mean, that, that makes sense, so, like, honestly, like, that's, that's, that's how, like, I originally did group it until, you know, you actually made me think about it. Right. And I was like, well, technically, fantasy is just, like, whatever, you know, whatever isn't real. So I guess just genre titles are not helpful. Uh, <laughs> with, Pretty much. With actually well, I feel describing like they're, the Well, I feel like they're good for movies because it, you know, whenever you're searching for a movie, it helps you identify which movie you're, like, in the mood for, right? Yeah. And so if you're in the mood for, like, a horror sci-fi thing, you can just look down horror or the sci-fi list until you find something that looks scary or scientific. Yeah. Um, but I feel like with video games, it's just more confusing because it's like, well, you know... Portal and Fallout 3 are completely different games, but they're both technically first-person shooters. Both technically sci-fi. I guess so, but I'm not... The example is more about, like, first-person shooters. Uh, So, I would... So, if I were... I wouldn't say I'm in the mood for a first-person shooter. I would say I'm in the mood for something really violent or something like that. Yeah. Or something with a lot of action in it. Whereas, uh, if I just... But if I look at the list of first-person shooters, it's like, it may not even be, you know, violent or yeah. action-y at all. Yeah. Um, that's true. Portal's also a puzzle platformer. That's true, and that's, that's like, a, the thing, is that they're both first-person shooters, but they're complete... Portal and, like, Call of Duty and Fallout 3 are completely different from each other, yet we all group them into the same genre. Yeah. So what would you say is its primary genre? For Portal or Fallout 3 um, or Call of Duty? Either or. I would say... Call of Duty, well, Call of Duty is a little bit weird because Call of Duty with like the multiplayer and like the zombies mode and stuff, it's technically like several different games all rolled into one. But I would call it an action game that uh, sometimes it'll have horror elements to it, and then sometimes it won't. It'll just be you know a, a game about a bunch of soldiers going around shooting terrorists and stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, I think I, you know, I think they should do to like clarify like uh, genres. What? It should just, like, add an adjective at the beginning of it. So, like, instead of saying, like, hey, Call of Duty's a first-person shooter, you say, hey, Call of Duty's a violent first-person shooter. That way, you really get between the lines. I was, really kind, of, I was kind of being a little, I don't know, I, I was being kind of, uh, I was kind of joking about the whole, like, violent thing. <laughs> now, now that I think about it, that's even, like, more, like, uh, that's kind of, like, still kind of obscure for what I'm looking for. Very because, vague. Yeah, it's pretty vague. Genre, uh, genres, in, just in general, are vague once well you that's think about that's them. the whole point of them right yeah but you want something that you want a word or a genre that classifies a game into a uh, sort of a category that you use to organize by and I don't think organizing it by if it uses a first person camera is a good way to do that uh, so with with portal I would say that that is a narrative I would say that that's it's a game where you solve puzzles, so I would call it a puzzle game, but there are some people who would say that a puzzle game is Tetris, so I, I'm kind of hesitant to even call it a puzzle game. Yeah. Uh, but I would call it a game where you solve, it's a puzzle game, uh, and then it's also, it's also narrative based too, because it sets up this nice sort of world, uh, and then you kind of go around uh, and learning about like certain characters and stuff like, so I would say it's a narrative based puzzle game. Yeah. 
We should have like some kind of like binomial nomenclature for it's video games, <laughs> <laughs> so we can we can like classify them and actually have like a tree of life, right, right, diagram where everything goes. That'd be cool. Here's Legend yeah. of Zelda. Here's what evolved from Legend of Zelda. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> It'd be crazy. Yeah, that's funny. So a what? So no, what? What genre would you consider the Legend of Zelda to be? Oh, um, back to this topic. Yeah, we kind of we kind of covered this topic already, <laughs> but I want to know what you say. I'd say pri- its primary um, primary genre is adventure. Secondary would probably be, be puzzle. Okay. Because they do rely heavily on puzzles, especially in the dungeons, and the dungeons are sort of like the real meat of the game. So yeah, adventure and then puzzle. Okay, so there's that word adventure again. So like, what yeah. what does that tell me about it though? Because it tells me that the character or the the character goes on an adventure. But in most games, don't you doesn't like pretty much all all game characters go on adventures in some way? Yeah, um, adventure to me is the exploration of the unknown. Well, I suppose. I mean. They change Hyrule so much where you don't really... I mean, you have a general sense, but it's still sort of the unknown, and you get to, you know, you get to explore it. Right, right. You know, delve into these deep dungeons. Okay. So, why not call it just, like, an exploration game, then? Or a discovery game, or something like that? Um, I mean, you could argue that just because adventure sounds more fancy. Yeah. Adventure... Ah... Technically, like, if you haven't played a game before, wouldn't every game be an adventure game, man? Not necessarily. The thing is, I wouldn't classify a lot of arcade games as adventure games. I wouldn't classify... you know what I'm saying. Like, most, you know, like, most console games would be, like, you know, adventure games. Like, let's take Call of Duty. Yeah. You haven't beat it before, so technically it is an adventure. Yeah. Even though there's, like, no discovery or, you know, exploration point to it. But there can be, like, when you're trying to look for intel and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. So there is like some actual exploration in pretty most pretty much every game. I think that a lot of the times people categorize just any game where you're exploring areas. I think that they categorize those games as adventure games. Yeah. I, uh, I guess by my own definition, something like Grand Theft Auto would be in the same vein as Zelda since you're exploring this unknown place. Okay. So I might I I think I'm going to change up my definition of adventure to um Exploration of the unknown with, um, I think, some facets of cl- classical hero's journey. Okay. S- something like that. Where the hero, he's in, his, um, he's in a safe space and then he gets whisked away into this unknown world and he has this whole story arc. Okay. Yeah. So the... Uh, Grand Theft Auto is kind of one of those games, too, where it has, like, multiple different kinds of genres, and you can play it, like, different ways depending on what you like to do. But, like, I never considered uh, Grand Theft Auto to be an adventure or a game about exploration, really. Yeah. Even though I totally realized that you could just yeah. spend that whole time yeah. playing it, just exploring and stuff. Searching but I always considered it more of an action steal. game. What was that, George? Searching for new cars to steal. Yeah, yeah. It's stuff yeah. like searching, searching for new car- cars and searching for new areas and stuff like that. New so, shops. Yeah, yeah. But isn't, well, technically, well, if that's the case, then I guess the reason why um, Grand Theft Auto wouldn't technically be that is because, like, you have a map right. that's, like, already drawn out everything that doesn't you. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an adventure, though, right? Like, you can still, you have, like, a top-down view, and then that helps you navigate throughout the world. But still, it doesn't compare with actually going to the places and finding them yourself. Maybe it's, like, True. like a tone thing. Yeah, I would. It's definitely like that with movies, right? Because yeah. horror movies are horror movies because they have a more of a spooky, scary tone. Yeah, and then yeah, comedies they usually just stick to the one thing, though. Like if you really think about it, like, um, like horror movies. When you watch a horror movie, you don't like you're you're often not laughing. You might laugh at something just because you're childish, like uh, right. my friends. But um, I'm not saying that all horror movies are devoid of laughter. But I'm just saying what makes a <laughs> horror movie a horror movie is the tone. Yeah, and like, and also the focus too though, because usually, you know, like all of it, all the way through, you're like, you know, it's horror versus like some little tangent. There's no real actual tangent in like a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Like there might be, but then like, it's just bad, you know, directorship or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. I said directorship, directing. 
I thought you said director shit at first. No, no, like, no. Oh, no, <laughs> director ship. Uh, I, think I, it's a, I think that's a word. Can't say Maybe that. Maybe it is. Can't <laughs> say that on radio. <laughs> Sharika. I think we already did on this radio. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to... Disclaimer, that's all that matters. Yeah. All right, but, uh... Hmm. It's difficult. So, um... Do you think something like Dark Souls w- is like an adventure game in the same way that Zelda is an adventure game? I would say that The Legend of Zelda and uh, Dark Souls are in the same genre. I wouldn't call it an adventure game because I kind of just don't like the word at this point. I would yeah. call it an exploration <laughs> action game. Yeah, I think when people usually think of adventure, they think of something that's a lot more more childlike, I guess. Okay. Where you're just this, like, kind of like Star Wars, where it's nothing really serious, like, n- like no one's getting blown up or like dismembered. Uh-huh. It's just a just a fun, just a fun little story where you, the, the where a guy goes and explores things. Right, right. So I think that's where people tend to think at the adventure genre, or what, or pe- what people think the adventure genre is. Okay. So question, how do we define RPG? Going back to RPGs, how do we... All the way back. All the way back. How do we define RPG like elements and stuff like that? Because I also remember that Dark Souls is an RPG. So what about... I wanted to call it an action exploration game, but there's more to it than that, right? So what... How, how can we define the certain, the, like, certain traits of RPGs so that we can kind of apply them to different games? Because you can't just say it's an RPG. Because there's not necessarily role playing involved, uh, and if there is role playing involved, there isn't necessarily the stats and progression inv- involved either. Whereas the name RPG has kind of just become, it's become an association with both of those things. With like role playing and like leveling up systems. Yeah, pretty much. Like you can, there are games where you can role play but not have like stat based progression and stuff like that. Yeah, and there. Are, RPGs where you can have stat based progression, but there's no actual like role playing or characters involved really. So, so our goal here is to define an RPG. Yeah, pretty much, and sort of like break it down into like two components: the role playing part and the stats part. So, do we? I mean, for simplicity, we could just call role playing role playing, right? Yeah. Um, and um, what would we call the stats part of it? Number crunching. Ah, but that doesn't sound good though. I would say, uh, call it like leveling or something. Progression. Oh yeah, that's a good word for it. Progression. So Dark Souls is a role-playing progression action exploration game. So at that point, now it's just way too difficult to say. Um, uh, action exploration progression game still I think it's still too hard to say still still too vague it's not too vague it's it points out specifically but it's just too long winded I think yeah and I guess that's where genres come in handy right maybe we just need more more like one word genres I guess so yeah so (laughs) and the thing is that Dark Souls technically we dissected we dissected the whole RPG thing into two sort of categories uh, but it's, Dark Souls has both those, so we could probably just call it an RPG. Uh, so it is an action exploration RPG. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was our goal? To define the RPG. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, if it's just those two, if it's just progression and role playing. Well, what what else would you describe an RPG as? Um, I guess just those two things. Okay. Need fantasy though, wouldn't it? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily. There are a lot of RPGs that have. Well, it's technically encompassed by the role playing. Yeah, that's it, like the it. fantasy of being a different character. Unless you're talking about just the general, theme really. in general. Because like, imagine <clears> being like, or like. Well, I guess that would work as well. But like, if you were playing like an RPG about a soldier mm-hmm. who was just like. A common day soldier. Yeah, or just like mm-hmm. you know, an RPG about a normal person. Like yeah. Bio- Bioshocks can be considered an RPG with its progression systems. I guess that's Bioshock. Yeah. Yeah, because technically, I would well, I would say, hmm. Yeah, you're right. There is progression like that, so I would definitely say there is progression there. But it's not 
that's not really a role playing game because you're not playing. Well, the whole thing isn't getting into the character, right? Well, um, there are role playing elements where you can choose to save the little sister or not. Right. Um, but that's just that's um. I guess the word would be like shallow okay. progression or shallow um, role playing. Yeah, I don't know. We we did actually talk about a little bit about Bioshock on a previous podcast and about the morality of saving little sisters and stuff like yeah. that. You know what? There is not enough of. What? I wish there was more retro science fiction. Like, what do you mean by that? No, there's a reason there's not a lot of that, and uh, because it limits what you can do. Like. You're saying more like steampunk, right? Well, or stuff like Bioshock, where it's set in like the 1950s and 40s. Right, steampunk. Well, it's not, not, not necessarily not steampunk, but steampunk. not necessarily like advanced, like technological. Which means you you can have this. Like if they if, if there were more retro sci-fi's, then it'd be like it'd be today. That's today. So you're saying that. Well, I think what Noah's kind of going for is he wants like almost sort of alternate reality type yeah, stuff, like, where it's like it's in the it sort of like has like uh, it has flavors of the past, but has like technology of the future. Yeah, it's it's more of a stylistic thing that I that I enjoy, like the like the Art Deco of Bioshock. Yeah, and like the um, the like a uh, fifties stuff to find of a Fallout new fuel source too. Though. You'd have to find it, uh, or you'd have to like honestly create a fuel source that would actually work, or create you, you know, like. I guess like if you wanted to do, you wanted to do, like uh, actual alternate reality and not something like you not actually throwing something that's fake in, right? You mean like um, using real aspects of the world, right? Um, yeah, uh, you can use real aspects. Um, you can also use like, f- like fake things. Um, like mana and just like, like um, uh. What's that one game? The um, the the kind of like the Victorian sneaky round game, stealth game. Oh, is it Dishonored. Yeah, Dishonored uses I think whale oil, but it's like weird like magic whale oil. Yeah. And it, it still fits the time for Victorian because, like all this like everything was running on whale oil back then. Right. But it, it's still. It's it's still um, I guess magical enough where you can have all this weird technology in yeah. this, in this uh, time period. Right, but they use they use magic, or they use actual magic in order to like go along with that though. Like, yeah, I remember, guess. Like the the main character Quervo, Quavo, Quavo, or something like that. Corvo. Corvo. He um, you know, he actually goes into a different dimension. Yeah. And actually gains power. So like, if you want to, you I mean like, is that what you want? Like, you mean more like dishonored? Cause yeah. Well. Well, just in general, just I, I agree the with idea that. of it's it's themed like the past, but there's just more like science stuff. Yeah. So I think this that's just kind of the theme that we're talking about here. I think what I the personally the would like about uh, what I what I like about retro science fiction is that you get to it's sort of like a window into the past and see what like someone in the nineteen in the nineteen fifties uh, thought the future would be like with like Fallout. Right. And I think that's just. Because I'm a huge history nerd, and I think it's just cool. And I, I just want more of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd agree, too. I really like that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you guys, like, get what I'm saying? Like, um, like I'm not against it, because, like, Dishonored is, like, you know, I played it, like, three times, and, like, yeah. you know, I That's beat cool. it three times in, like, a week. So, you know, I actually did enjoy the game. Right. Like, um, it's just that, like... I can see that there are limits unless you actually pull some stuff from like that actually happened from history. Like unless you're willing to create, you know, like an alternate route, like honestly alternate route that you know uh, this actually happened or whatever, and then you have to have a set of events that happened before I think, that. I then, think you don't necessarily uh, need it to be based in the real world, right? Because dishonor, oh, like, dishonor um, isn't necessarily like that. It's not necessarily taking place in this world. It's this sort of like weird, like world where it's everything's like based on like whale oil and stuff like that but if we had magic like, I'm whale oil like, um, we'd, we'd be we'd be sitting gold yeah the, the, the reason be, the reason I was saying that was like because like I believe you compared it to Star Wars right but like just the opposite of that like um I was thinking like cause in Star Wars you know um well I, I guess I see it that way too then cause they did technically have a magical force thing yeah. 
Right. The force. So actually, I see it. Never mind. I was just saying, like, um, you know, like if you use like steam, like you know, like the whole retro thing, like in reality, mm-hmm. based off of like what actually ha- happened in like real life, it'd be pretty difficult considering like um, you had everything based on like steam and like water and not necessarily petroleum and gas. You really limited what you could do. Yeah. So, well, I think I think that's sort of the whole fun of doing of doing that, uh, yeah. one of these games that's based in that's for, in, like, in the, the past creative. though but because it gives like you like a nice sort of theme to go along with. Whereas if you can't if you're kind of just given direction to go anywhere, it you kind of just do like the most generic thing. But if you have like some sort of limitation, it helps you be creative because it just kind of gives you like a nice sort of guideline that isn't the normal sort of generic thing. I think that makes sense. Um. Have you ever played Arkham City? I've not played Arkham City. Uh, Arkham City? Or the Batman Arkham City? Um, is that that's the new one? It's not the newest one. It's from like 2011, I think. Is that oh, where he, right. he has to fight Ra's al Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, I played it. I played yeah, it. there's this part where it, he goes into like this whole underground city where it's all like Victorian stuff. Uh-huh. And they're powering everything on um, uh, Lazarus Pit Juice. Lazarus pit juice. Um, it's uh, it's stuff that like brings you back to life, but also makes you crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think in a, I think that's as close as steampunk, the whole genre would get to realism. Okay. Because a whole lot of stuff I'm seeing in the in the steampunk genre now seems a little too far fetched for my taste. Right. Um. Where it's all these, uh, where everyone's like wearing all these gears and goggles, right? And I think it's kind of lame. Um, but if it was more like realistic, right? It it'd just be like classical Victorian outfits, right? Yeah. That's just my that's just an opinion. I you know a I game that did a really good job, or yeah, I did a really good job. But like the whole you know the whole steampunk thing was the uh, um, was Dark Void. I mean like the um, I like, kind of heard of that. You never played. You never heard of Dark Void. Dark never Void. No. You never heard of Dark Void. Have you heard of Dark Void? Ooh. What? Hmm, I think um, you might be making this game up. You, you you look it up. Look it up right now. You Dark Void is a real this. game. And um, well, basically, you know, you're centered in your your character from England, and it's so like around the Victorian era. Yeah. And well, the the story kind of makes it doesn't make that much sense to me, so it's like really confusing. Is this it? It looks more like a sci-fi game than a steampunk game. But it's a steampunk game, game trust me. Like is Thomas it? Edison is in, is in it and everything. Oh uh, wait, so is is this? Huh. Like this is like without petroleum and like they're using electricity and steam and stuff. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed that from all the screenshots and stuff. Yeah, it looks, it looks but straight up like a sci-fi. The the, the jetpack is from because like they they go to like a, a a different realm or whatever. So they like they've been developing technology over there. Just not a lot. It's just not very good considering that you weren't. They had to pull like the technology from the real world and advance it in there. Okay. So they didn't have many resources. They created that based off of. Um, the limited technology that they did have. Okay. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of the creativity in these retro sci-fi games come from. Um, is that they create all these weird devices to circumvent the, the limitations of their time, and I yeah. think that's what's cool about it. Yeah, you're right. That is probably yeah. That's that is really cool actually. Yeah. I don't know if you guys did. You guys play Bioshock Infinite at yeah, all? Yeah, I love that game. I played a little bit of it, but okay. I didn't play like you know, the whole thing. I tried to play more, but. It wasn't working when I downloaded the demo. There was a, a cool thing in, uh, I believe it was the Burial at Sea Part 2 yeah. uh, DLC, where it, they basically sort of, uh, they sort of say that, like, they're in Bioshock there are, like, two, set, there, well, there are technically, like, a million, diff- or a gazillion different realities. Spoiler. Spoiler. But, but uh, basically... Every episode now, I think, actually, right? They were, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, so there was been, one that wasn't. The past few episodes. But, oh, one. But in uh, Burial at Sea Part 2, there's this cool thing where they talk about the two separate realities and how basically what happened is that people were traveling or communicating between realities yeah. and they were each like exchanging technology and then that explains why each reality was, was the way it was. Yeah. That's cool. And with, I thought it was really um, nifty that. With uh, uh, Fink and Chu Chong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool too. Um, would you 
Have you played Have you played Bloodborne? I've not actually played Bloodborne. Anyone here play Bloodborne? Kind of. I think Jason played Bloodborne. I imagine it's like a lore narrative based question. Yeah. So I've seen like it's, footage of can it. You it's just, um, I was I was just gonna ask if any of you would classify that as a as like steampunk because it looks very gothic and kind of Victorian. Um, the thing is, I. Uh, you don't. I, w- I think you're labeling steampunk as just kind of anything that's like in the past. But I think there's. A, I think I would call it a period, sort of, uh, sort of, theme game. I. Think. I, how I define steampunk is less about the steam and more about just the Victorian era. Okay. So anything that's stylistically looks Victorian, is steampunk for me. I mean, okay. there's there's also like, like deco punk, which would like be something like Bioshock. Or right. Or like, um, like clockwork stuff, which would even be in further in the past. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like whenever I imagine steampunk, I always just imagine like cosplayer with tons of like weird gear shit all over yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, and goggles. And yeah, and stuff like that. But like, I don't know. I feel like there's a more accurate way to describe the theme of steampunk? one of these games than just calling it steampunk. Oh. Yeah. So you can with one way is that you can just call it by the era on which it's based. So I would just call it Victorian, Victorian, Victorian. a Victorian theme, mm-hmm. a fantasy Cthulhu Victorian theme. See yeah. that that's what I was thinking, like, because um, I only just heard <coughs> steampunk at the beginning of the semester, huh? And like I always knew what it was, I just never knew it had a specific name. I was always thinking like, you know, that's just a Victorian era style, uh, the Victorian era style game. And then the guy was like, oh, yeah, let's do steampunk. I'm sitting there like, what? Steampunk? So, like, I, I just couldn't understand why you would need to call it something other than, you know, the era. Like, why would you classify it as steampunk when you could say, hey, look, Victorian. Unless there are other um, Victorian type, type style games that aren't necessarily based around, I there's guess, like steam. There's, like, Cthulhu stuff. Like, um, what's that? There was, like, this, um... This in this indie game that came out that was set in like some kind of asylum that was all based around Cthulhu uh, stuff. It sounds awesome, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's a what game? I can't remember what it's called, but it was set in like this old timey Victorian asylum, and all these like these old gods kept like I don't know kept. It wasn't rising. Outlast, was it? No, it wasn't Outlast. I was thinking like Outlast. I was like like no, it's not Outlast because it's not really all that Cthulhu. Yeah. A lot of Scary horror game. games are set in asylums. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's move on to uh, our Fallout-related uh, topic, since Ian wanted to talk about Fallout a little bit. Uh, okay, so I've heard that Fallout 4 has like a ton of bugs coming out, So, uh, and apparently the game is really good, though. So what do you guys think about this, about developers releasing a game, it's got a lot of bugs in it, The game, but the game is really good. Just what do you, do you think that's responsible, or do you think it's just kind of, Im- that it's sort of a little unrealistic to expect a game to be completely finished? By the time it comes out, or what are your guys' opinions? Can George be honest? Yeah, go on ahead, George. It seems like most new or every new gen game I've played has had that issue. Like, it's not done yet, but it's been released, and it's like I don't I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like the way that that the engines are set up or whatever that um that they can't like fix everything in the set yeah. time just because it's like a new gen console. They haven't updated their systems yet or something. Yeah, I don't know, but. It seems like every new gen game has had like a lot of bugs with it. Like drawing back to Halo Five, they're not they're not even done with it. And I can tell you that for a fact. There are a lot of game modes that they that we know they're gonna put in there. There's a lot of um, like weapons and item stuff that we know they're gonna put in there. Um, another game would be like you said, Fallout Four. I haven't played that yet. I'm interested to play it, but I'm pretty sure it does have like a lot of bugs considering it's such a huge game. Yeah, my sort of opinion on like Bethesda RPGs especially is that I've always just assumed that like these games are so like complicated and like difficult to run by a machine that it's like I don't know, it's just there are going to be bugs anyways. Yeah. And so it's, Yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah. Like Bethesda RPGs are kinda are kind of famous for their bugs. And I think I guess I'm kind of making an exception for Bethesda because I want to say that's okay for them. I know they're going to just fix the bugs anyways, and I know that it's difficult to, like, have these games run perfectly. Yeah, Yeah. especially since they have, like, uh, you know, times where they have to get them out. Like, I'm pretty sure if they had, like, another three years, they'd be like, hey, I can get it done, but... Well, I, I guess so. So I have a story about... This one time, I got screwed over by bugs in games. Did you? Yeah. So over the summer, 
I was hyped for one game, and that was Batman Arkham Knight. Oh. And, because I love the series so much, as we were talking about, like, Arkham City before. Yeah, yeah. And so I had finally come into a lot of money, a little bit over $1,000, and I, and I spent it all buying all the parts for, this, for, my, for my homemade PC. And the day it came out, um, I was still waiting for two more parts, which were, which was um, the Wi-Fi card and the disk drive. And so I log on to Steam, and it's already been taken off because of all the bugs. Wow. So I, I literally just finished it in time to, for <laughs> it to get taken off. That's really funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least you didn't have to, like, you know, be super disappointed that the game didn't run. Yeah. Well, I still would have been... I mean, if it was just a matter of running it at just, like, minimal, absolutely, like, minimal right. uh, graphics level, then I think that would have been fine since I'm not that huge on graphics... Um, but I think it was it was just the fact that it just got taken off right as I finished my PC. Wow, that's that's crazy. Yeah. All right, Ian, what do you think about Fallout Four? From the small bit I've played, I haven't noticed any like real bugs or glitches. But I've put like hour in into it so far. Okay. That's no, we're close to that. Yeah. Um, I have heard of some of the bugs and glitches. Um. I've never been a fan of like allowing them, but I've always been, but I've always been pretty understanding when it comes to them because I know no game is perfect on release. I no game is perfect ever. General. Well, the thing is that games used to be perfect on release because well, that was not all you even got. Then. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, they weren't they weren't perfect, but they had to be. They had to work really well. And they had mm-hmm. to be really airtight that no bug was going to just completely destroy everything. Well, I, there were still games that did that. Well, yeah, but they were typically terrible and were unsuccessful. Well, I mean, like it that. even happened in the old, um, not Donkey Kong, but Kong games. Okay. That it's that there were times where you would start out the level and everything would just be frozen. Wow. Okay. And you, the only way to fix it would be to return your copy <laughs> and get another one. Wow. I mean, even back then there were game-breaking bugs... And I mean, a lot of the reason why those bugs happen is because it's the machine reaching its limits. Okay. Or yeah. it's because of optimization problems. Or even like stuff with cartridges where, like like in classic NES stuff where you get those blue and purple screens, screens if uh, there was just even dust in there. Oh, I guess so, but that's... Mm, Which was a weird that's, thing. That's kind of, I, I guess you're right, that's kind of a hardware failing, but... Yeah. I don't know. There are a lot, and there are a lot. Of, the, the NES was also famous for having like crazy bugs too. But I don't know. The tech tech was so old back then. I kind of like, give it a pass. I think we've we've um, we've sl- we've slid from hardware issues to software issues. Right. Where these games are just getting so huge and big with huge teams that that I don't think anyone can yeah can actually pay attention to everything in the code. Right. And that was going to be another one of my points, too, is that it's just these games are getting so complicated that it's, like, it's almost going to be impossible for, like, all the books to get squished anyways. Yeah. No, but I'm, like... I guess, I guess then, at, at that point, it's, like, um, using, you know, the actual people who's going to buy the game as, like, guinea pigs. Uh-huh. So that way, you know, they could, like... Um, you know, since... It's, like, it's more like, since we couldn't find the bugs, maybe you can. Uh-huh. And that's I th- understandable. I think if you if there's like uh, if the developer release is like a beta, then that's fine. That's then that's one way that you combat all the bugs is that you op- you have a beta period, and then uh, you have all your really dedicated fans squish all the bugs for you, and then by the time you're actually releasing, it's you know per- pretty much perfect for the most part. Here's a question: What is the best bug you've ever had? The best bug. I actually talked about this. Uh, I talked about this a couple podcasts ago. One of my favorite bugs was I was playing Ninja Gaiden on NES, and uh, I went. I, I entered this boss room, and uh, it was a boss where there were like two gargoyles on like pillars, and uh, the boss basically is the two gargoyles jump around. And you, have to, you have to kill both of them. But uh, the NES had this bug sometimes where it duplicates enemies, yeah. and so what wound up happening was I got through killing uh, half of the boss's health. And they just spawned in another pair of bosses, and that was really crappy. But then I beat them, and I felt really good about myself. So that's my favorite like bug story. Yeah. All right, you guys. Um, I once did beta testing for ESO, which oh. is Elder Scrolls Online. Yep. And um, 
I actually got stuck under a dock for like a half hour, <laughs> and I just could not figure out how to get un how to get unstuck. Okay. And I think I just ended up porting back to whatever town was closest to me. Okay. And I think that was just a real terrible thing because I because you only had that for like you only could play the beta for a certain amount of time and it right. really just ate up my time. Yeah, that's funny. George, you? I don't think I have any. Um, I mean, obviously I've encountered bugs before, but I can't think of any one that really made me feel like, yeah, I like this bug. Or like one that's like funny or something like that. Funny, terrible, memorable ones. I can't even think of one. All right, Ian, you? Um, it was actually during the Knights of the Old Republic mm -hmm. beta, and it's that uh, what happened was I was going through as like a Jedi Knight, I think, and what ended up happening was I got, or I like finished like a beginner quest, and I got like, um what was it, like, a million credits for? And it's like, I think that might not <laughs> be on purpose. Right, right. All right. That's funny. Oh, wait, wait. So you mean, like, uh, do I have to have had played this? Or, like, or, I mean, I did play it, but, like, do they have to have been, like, on an actual You can answer the question however you want, George. Okay, so I actually encountered a bug today when I was uh, when I was working on a game with my group. Okay. We were, as like, the main character, he, like, he would move close to, like, a light post. Uh-huh. And then as he got closer to the light post, you know, the, the light post just kind of followed him. So, like, when, like, uh, when you would, like, turn, the light post would also follow you and it would turn with you. And then, like, like everywhere you went, like, the light post would even jump when you jumped. Right. It was really crazy. I was like, wow. Mm. I like post is stalking the player. That's yeah, it was like, <laughs> and we couldn't even figure out why that was happening. Like it was like it was it was crazy. It just was the light post a child of the character? It wasn't. Hmm, that's really weird. I imagine the main character is in his house, and you just see a lamp post <laughs> behind the curtains. <laughs> uh, all right, so it's about time for us to wrap up, guys. So, uh, yeah, do you guys have anything that you want to plug at all? Fallout Four. That's that's out today. I don't think Fallout 4 needs yeah. any more promotion, but okay, sure. Bye Fallout 4, guys. Uh, Ian, you? Um, we are holding a Magic Tournament next week, Tuesday, so that would be the 17th from 5pm to 9pm at MATC room M154. Yep, so if you're an MATC student, or can, can other people come? Can other people from out, from out of the school can come. Okay, awesome. George, anything for you? Nah, I do the same plug every week, pretty much. All right, all right. For for me, you can buy my video game, uh, Demon Hearts, on Steam. Uh, also follow me at John Harwood Dev on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And yeah, that's about it. So uh, we'll see you later, audience. Bye bye. Later. See ya. Bye.
The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the original speaker. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Milwaukee Area Technical College.